The Legend of Zelda was one of the first games to let you save your progress. And at the time, this was something of a revelation. But the interesting thing isn't that you could save your game. It's how Nintendo brought together existing technologies at just the right time and in just the right way. This is the story of how The Legend of Zelda saves your game. There are many ways to design a save system. Most modern implementations revolve around the concept of a save file, which stores all of the important information about a game's world and characters, allowing players to load a file and pick up right where they left off. But this isn't really how save games worked in the beginning. Probably the most famous example of an early video game that let you save your progress was the 1977 text-based adventure, Zork. From the beginning, the game seems to have had a full save system, but it was buggy and the files it produced were quite large for the time, so the developers ended up replacing it with a much simpler password system. While some games like Ultima 1 would save files for each of the player's characters, the first PC game that I could find with a more modern all-in-one save was 1981's Wizardry. Regardless of who was first, it was pretty clear that by the early 80s, save systems were very much a thing on the PC, with most save game files being written to five and a quarter floppy disks. But consoles really didn't have access to rewritable media like this, so they were lagging quite a bit behind. The first console game to have any sort of save system is 1983's Survival Island for the Atari 2600. The game uses a rudimentary password system organized around a series of checkpoints, basically allowing you to skip portions of the game that you've already completed. Completed. Passwords would be used on console games for a long time, with later titles leveraging them to encode all sorts of data about the player's progress. As far as save mechanisms are concerned, passwords leave a lot to be desired. They're usually pretty long, have to be physically written down, and it's easy for players to make a mistake when transcribing them. These shortcomings were likely on the minds of the developers at Nintendo as they began work on The Legend of Zelda back in 1984. But thankfully, they didn't have to worry about it too much, because that game was being made for a new kind of system, one with three writable floppy disks. In 1986, Nintendo released the Famicom Disk System, an extension to the Japanese version of the NES that allowed the console to play games from proprietary floppies called disk cards. These disks could hold more data than the ROM chips of the game cartridges at the time at a fraction of the cost and had the advantage of being completely rewritable. The Legend of Zelda was the flagship game for the system, and one of its biggest features was that you could save your progress directly to the game's disk. This was the first time a console game could create save files just just like games on the PC. And in a lot of ways, The Legend of Zelda's system was just better. At the time, saving any type of file on a PC was kind of cumbersome. After initiating a save command of some sort, most programs would require that you enter a direct path to where you wanted to save a file. This would often involve swapping floppy disks, typing in a file path, waiting for the save to complete, then potentially swapping disks again. The Legend of Zelda didn't do any of this. Instead, the game requires players to register their saves up front Front, then choose one of the initialized files prior to starting play. Since the game was always being played within the context of one of these files, and the saves were stored on the game disk itself, players didn't have to specify a save path or fumble with additional floppies. While this was all definitely a leap forward for console gaming, the disk system itself had some serious problems. In comparison to cartridges, games took a lot longer to load, and the disks themselves were easy to damage or accidentally erase. And while it was cheaper for Nintendo to produce Produce games for the system, it was also much easier for games to be pirated. This had been a pretty serious problem back in the early 80s as PC game discs were rampantly and illegally copied by game rental shops, causing the Japanese government to pass legislation banning the rental of video games entirely. Nintendo had announced that the disc system would be coming to the United States by 1986, but it never did. This was likely due to all of these problems in combination with plummeting semiconductor prices, and the fact that mapper chips were already already beginning to obsolete the hardware in the disk system by 1987. The end result was that if Nintendo wanted to bring Zelda to America, they'd have to find a way to get the game's save system to work without the use of a floppy disk. And thankfully for them, there was already a game that had figured out a way to do this. The game is called Pop and Chips, and it was released in 1985 for the Super Cassette Vision, a Japanese-only game console competitor of the Famicom. 
Pop and Chips used a bit of circuitry called a battery-backed SRAM to persist data even if the system was shut down. The game's cartridge was manufactured to be extra tall to accommodate a couple of AA battery slots, which were connected to a diode circuit that would switch one of the game's internal SRAM chips to batteries when it was disconnected from external power. SRAM, or Static Random Access Memory, chips are a kind of memory that are set and forget. Unlike dynamic or DRAM chips, the contents of an SRAM don't need to be constantly refreshed, meaning they'll keep any data you set as long as you keep supplying them with power. For the cartridge version of The Legend of Zelda, Nintendo basically just took this exact idea from Pop and Chips, but streamlined it quite a bit. Instead of requiring that users supply their own power via replaceable batteries, they soldered a small coin battery directly to the PCB, hiding the mechanism entirely. There's an argument to be made that the Pop and Chip solution was better, since it allowed the end user to easily replace place the batteries once they've died. But you gotta remember that SRAM chips only draw a small amount of power when they're sitting idle, meaning most coin batteries would often last well over a decade. That said, as of the making of this video, it's been about 37 years since those original Zelda batteries hit the shelves, so it's my guess that at this point, they're pretty much all dead. Regardless, this was a major change to the way that the game would go about operating, which had some pretty big ramifications. First, a lot of the game's addressing logic would have to be completely rewritten. The Famicom Disk System works by loading a game's program code from the floppy into a 32 kilobyte bank of memory, which is then addressed by the main system via the cartridge connector. The memory in this bank will often be rewritten by a game's program at runtime to change the code or data as needed. The cartridge version of the game doesn't work like this at all, instead relying on a single program ROM chip in combination with the MMC1 memory. Mapper. Instead of loading and rewriting program data on the RAM chip, the mapper selects which banks are active on the program ROM, which is then directly connected to the system's main address and data buses. The game's program controls the mapper by sending data to special memory addresses, allowing it to access different pages of code or data while the game is running. As you might imagine, the code to control a memory mapper and the code to rewrite data on the disk system's internal RAM is quite different, meaning the game would have to be restructured at a pretty deep level. And in addition to these big structural changes, the save code would have to be rewritten entirely. The disk system has a small BIOS chip that provides a bunch of common disk reading and writing routines to the developers. And the original save code in The Legend of Zelda used these BIOS calls to save and load data from the game's disk. The cartridge version would, of course, have to scrap all of this code, instead reworking the routines to write data directly to the battery-backed SRAM chip, which is mapped to a specific address range by the MMC1. An interesting thing to note here is that the SRAM chip on the cartridge is, for the most part, just as fast to access and update as the system's main memory. Meaning, if they wanted to do it, the US version of The Legend of Zelda could have been the first game with continuous real-time saves. My guess is that this was never really a consideration, as it's pretty easy for the data in the SRAM to get corrupted. Another big ramification of switching to a battery-backed SRAM is that the game became way faster. If you go back and play any disk system game, one of the first things you'll notice is that it takes an incredibly long time to load. This makes a lot of sense since reading and writing to magnetic disks is much, much slower than accessing RAM, a problem that plagued PC games for years. I was a little too young at the time to really know, but I imagine if you were a PC gamer from the early 80s who happened to pick up a Nintendo, The Legend of Zelda must have felt amazing. Though when you really think about it, the game didn't do anything brand new at least in terms of technology. The save system itself was an adaptation of a system that had already been developed and iterated upon in PC games, and the battery-backed SRAM circuit was just a streamlined implementation of one that was introduced by a competitor. I don't think it's a bad thing that Nintendo didn't invent all this technology, it's honestly not their MO. Historically, the company's been at its best when it repurposes or reimagines existing technologies. It's similar in game programming, computer science, and mathematics. Greatness isn't usually achieved by creating something entirely new, it's often done by being able to see something that already exists in a new way. This sort of thinking is a skill, a skill you can develop in a free and easy way using this video's sponsor, Brilliant.
Brilliant is the best way to learn and practice computer science, programming, and mathematics interactively, and has a slew of lessons that can help you hone your own skills, whether you're just getting started with 8-bit programming or want to build a whole game. The Thinking in Code course is particularly good and focuses on helping you build an intuition around looping and branching, which is fundamental to all low-level programming on the NES. Brilliant is free to try for 30 days, so head over to brilliant.org slash nesshacker and sign up today. The first 200 people who use the link will get 20% off an annual plan. 